Okay, so what has traditionally been done in terms of data analysis in these inventories is pretty simple, okay? And it's basically something that you can do in your head while you're out in the field. The, the term is species accumulation curves, um, but really, you know, imagine we don't have any computer, any theory about sampling, nothing like that. All we've got is a good brain, right? And I say, you know, Caleb, go out and get me, you know, observations, records, specimens of every herp in Corrup National Park. Probably what you're gonna do is you're gonna go out and you're gonna spend days and each day you're gonna say, yeah, I hadn't gotten this one before. I hadn't gotten this one before. And then, you know, you've been there two months and you're tromping around to all the different places that are accessible to you and you're trying all sorts of different things and you get to a point where you're just not finding any records of anything new. And so at some point you're gonna say, Town, I'm done. You know, it's been three weeks since I found a species that wasn't already on my list. Can I please go home? Right? So that's, that's the whole idea of species accumulation curves. So I can show you a lot of examples. And I, I wanna show you some examples just because the diversity of examples will be good. So this is a, a study, the relationship between regional and local species diversity in marine benthic communities of global perspective. So they, they go out and they found a bunch of um, sites, in fact it's 49 sites, plotted as a function of number of quadrats censused using the Chow 2 estimate of species richness um, color-coded by region, blah, blah, blah. Now all I want you to see is that here the unit of area, or sorry, the unit of effort in our species accumulation curve is not day, like we'll probably do in Corup, but rather it's quarter meter squared quadrat. So they're plopping this tiny little square down on the ocean floor and they're seeing how many species of, I assume, invertebrates and such are present in that square, okay? Now I want you to see a bunch of things. Um, tell me about that inventory. Is Caleb ready to go home? Yes. Tell me about that inventory. No, no exactly. Um, but also notice, for example, here, if this inventory had ended right there, it had gone like five days without finding many new species. And then something bumped it up right there. Or here, this one was leveling off, this green one was leveling off, and then it started to go up again. Okay? Here's another big bump. Any idea why that happens? It happens when there's heterogeneity amongst your samples. So for example, if it wasn't Caleb, but rather Mark or Jacob that I sent to Corrup National Park, and they stay there a whole year, and they're, you know, they're riding that curve up, and it's going up and up and up, and it starts to level off, and then all of a sudden it goes up again, Maybe that's getting into November or December when migratory birds are flying in from, from Europe, okay? Or maybe in this case where we have quadrats, maybe they're placing those quadrats here and here and here and they get in, they start sampling, you know, the, the eastern end of the study area and maybe the eastern end of the study area is not presenting the same set of environments as the western end of the study area. So usually, when through time you get these jumps and jags, that is a function of heterogeneity of some sort. Okay? And in fact, 
the other way to put the same concept is, let's see, when you get these plateaus like there and like there, that may also be because of what we call temporal autocorrelation, which is to say maybe you are walking this direction one, day, one set of days, but then walking you know, out here another set of days. And it may be that there's you know, one male frog calling up in the canopy, and every time Rafe and Dave and the other herp guys walk that way, they hear it. But when they go this way, they don't hear it, okay? So you end up, you know, if you do those days all together and then start exploring this, uh, this way, that produces a temporal autocorrelation. So autocorrelation is when you have correlation within a series. So days within an inventory tend to be more similar if they're adjacent days rather than distant days in the series. Okay? How else can we get temporal autocorrelation? Well, the first three days we're at Corrup, it doesn't rain. And the next four days, it does rain. Well, the first three days, those frogs are, are just trying to stay moist. And then when it's raining, they're thinking, okay, the rain started, peep, 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 peep. And so all of a sudden, the herp data look like zeros and ones. Okay, that's a temporally autocorrelated series. And you commonly see that in inventory data. And so that's one reason why when we get later in the day, we want to do some randomizations. We want to break up those temporal autocorrelations. Okay, but we'll come back to that. Here's another example. This is a study species area and species individual relationships for tropical trees, a comparison of 350 hectare plots. And so this is looking at the accumulation of species as you go over larger and larger numbers of individuals. Okay? And so this is definitely something that, for example, Moses could do with the data that will come out of uh, the sampling for, for the trees in Corrup. The other thing to notice is these are on log-log scales, which is to say here you're looking at one individual, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. And here you're finding one species, 10 species, and 100 species. Okay? So you have to be careful of these scaling things because up here, you know, that point might be slightly higher than that point, but here the scale is, is quite coarse and here the scale is quite fine. You know, the, the distance between zero species and one species is this. And the distance between 800 and 801 species is tiny. So just be careful with those scales. Here you go, Herp guys. Assessing biodiversity with species accumulation curves, inventories of small reptiles by pit trapping in Western Australia. And we can see number of individuals. So again, it's the, the unit of effort is individuals and the number of species caught, okay? Notice, look at that one. See, there's that big jump where they had gone, let's say, from 4,000 to 10,000 individuals, and they had really leveled off at about 42 species. So in 6,000 individuals, they added one or two species. And then for some reason at this site, in just the space of a few hundred individuals, they go up five species, right? So that kind of stinks of a little bit of heterogeneity in their sampling. But you can also see that these different samples are starting to level off in different places, okay? Providing that at Barrow Island, 
There isn't some big jump when they switch habitats or it starts raining or it stops raining or something like that. Okay? But what they're doing is they're starting to say, oh, look, we've got these inventories leveling off at different places, except Red Sands versus Bungal Bin. Those two look like they're going to level off at the same place. Maybe they won't. Okay, that's why we use these completeness statistics. Deep sea species richness, regional and local diversity estimates from quantitative bottom sampling. So. Here it's number of samples. So probably they're you know, putting some sort of scoop in, pulling out a bucket full of mud, and then sorting through that. And so in your average first sample, you're getting between you know, 30 and 125 species. But in your average second, sample, look at that, you're almost doubling the number of species. So that's saying that, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about the spatial and, and environmental context of this sampling, but that's saying that, you know, literally the first bucket of mud that I sort through and the second bucket of mud that I sort through probably don't share hardly any species. Because notice that the number almost doubles between first and second samples. That might actually be a really great indication of heterogeneity because it's pretty hard to drop the same scoop in the same place, right? So like you're always sampling different spots. Exactly. So like every single sampling event is in a completely different place, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and in fact, that idea of heterogeneity can literally go down to a micro, micro, micro scale to the point where, you know, if this organism is there, then this organism can't be there. So immediately you have some sort of uh, turnover just because you have literally individual bodies taking up space. But yeah, this is saying that either the invertebrate community is hyper, hyper diverse or that the environmental landscape that it's re responding to is really fine with respect to their sampling. Species accumulation curve for Agarex and Boletti from a Caledonian pine wood. I have to say I don't even know what Agarex and Boletti are. Oh, mycology. Okay, that makes, that makes sense that I don't know. Um, very messy accumulation curve, huge jump, but then there's this comment about data for visits seven to 12 omitted. Oh no, that's fitting the curve, I see. So it looks like for some reason they didn't like these samples in the middle. Let's not go into that. Uh, the point is simply, if you saw this accumulation, you should be worried about heterogeneity. Okay, something is getting in there and, you know, look at this. You're really starting to level off and then boom, you double the numbers and then you've leveled off. Something, something was going on, but I, I didn't read the paper in detail. Okay, any questions about species accumulation curves? Hold on one sec. Thank you for the presentation. And, uh, I had a, a preoccupation about uh, what can explain the gap between the number of uh, individuals against the number of uh, species. When I saw one curve, uh -huh. uh, from you have uh, five species between six individuals, six hundred individuals. When you see the curve, it, 